So we're now going to be joined by Becca Riders from Alta Consultancy and Management Services. So Becca is an experienced researcher working within social housing and she uses mixed methods and is passionate about using evidence to develop policy and practice. And her research includes homelessness, housing association tenants, experiences of claiming universal credit, occupancy within social housing and the impact of waiting for social housing. And Becca today is going to be talking about floor coverings in social housing. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks for all the presenters so far. I found this a really interesting conference. Um, hopefully you can see those slides. Um, give me a shout yes, if can. not. Brilliant. Yeah, Fabulous. Um, so this is about research into provision of floor coverings in social housing, which I think is really relevant to a lot of the topics that have been discussed today, particularly around material deprivation. Um, it's funded by the Longley Foundation. And let's get that actually going. Um, I think this slide makes it sound like it's the beginning of a novel, but um, Altair is a management consultancy that provides support to socially focused organisations. We primarily work with social housing providers on all aspects of um, the development and management and governance of social housing. Longley is a grant making foundation that was set up by um, a housing association and provides grants to primarily social housing tenants. And they saw the need for this research because they realised they were giving out a lot of grants for floor coverings in social housing. Um, and so they wanted to investigate the impact of that and the standards. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. And um, Jennifer's introduced me, so I'm not going to talk about myself anymore. Um, but just to say, I previously worked at the National Housing Federation, which is um, how I got a lot of experience within social housing. And just a quick overview for those who don't anything about social housing. So at the last count in March 2020 in Great Britain there are 4.9 million social rented homes. That means it's the smallest tenure out of um, all types of dwellings. Um, most of that is concentrated in England. There's 4 million um, social rented homes in England and the majority of these are owned by private registered providers which is basically housing associations and the remainder are owned by local authorities. Um, and when you look at people living within social housing, they're more likely than any other tenures to be in the lower income brackets. So when we look at the family resources survey data, 37% of social rented households have a gross income of less than £400 per week. And that's compared to 19% living in the private rented and 25% who own outright um, and then 5% buying with a mortgage. In the UK, 70% of Social renters receive one or more income related benefits, which is three times higher than any than for all households. And those benefits are mainly housing benefit and council tax reduction. But that doesn't mean to say they're not working. So there's 43 percent in England are in full or part time work. Um, and there's a scarcity of social housing within the country. And that means it's allocated to those in the greatest housing need um, and for those who can't afford to access housing on the open market. And that graph um, to the right there, I have um, just copied from the English Housing Survey and talks about how there's um, tenants living within social rented housing are more likely than or social housing, sorry, are more likely than any others to have a vulnerability um, when compared to other tenures. So 54% of social rented households have um, a member with a long term illness or disability. And we know from the FRS that the um, national figure is 24%, so much greater representation. And 8% of social renters have experienced homelessness and 18% are from lone, are lone parent households. And just a bit about the research, um, as I mentioned, Longley saw the need for the research because of the grant making they were doing. Um, so they asked us to, they commissioned us to investigate the impact of and opportunities for social housing providers flooring standards in Wales, Scotland and England. And they wanted us to keep tenant voice at the heart of the research. It, the research took place over a period of about two years. Um, stand, design was desktop analysis, including literature and policy review, surveys with landlords, uh, grant makers and tenants, um, focus groups and interviews um, with tenants and with social landlords and a roundtable stakeholder session. And we also did cost analysis. And then um, because of the length of time um, doing the research, we updated the literature and policy review. And the final outputs for that, which you can see on our website, are three learning reports. Um, and because of the focus on the tenant perspective, then one of those reports is focused on the tenant and the third one is focused on the landlord. Um, and then the final report was published in May. Um, 
In terms of floor covering practice, so there is a disparity in standards uh, across Britain um, across so in Wales, we can see that the standards and funding are available. So um, the, this research by Longley was actually inspired by um, a piece of research done by Taipob and Tupas Cymru, um, which explored floor covering provision and led to a change in standards in Wales through the Welsh Housing Quality Standard. And when that change in standard would introduce, then the Welsh Government um, gave, um, house, gave social landlords um, additional money to um, improve the standards. So there's standards and funding within Wales. In Scotland there's funding but no standards um, and in England there's limited standards through the decent home standard and no funding. And we did a survey of social landlords and we found that 90% of general needs homes, that's um, homes for people with general needs who don't have support needs, um, do not have floor coverings in all rooms at point of let. And that's largely because of these this disparity in standards. So because it's not regulated or required, then um, it's it's not, um, then people don't do it. Um, and how many people are affected? Um, so MRI, we work with MRI software who run the resident voice index, which is um, social renters who are looking to move. And we found through that that almost four and five tenants move into a home with no or partial floor covering. So that's 77% of um, people surveyed, uh, nearly 8,000 tenants there, and 9% of these are still living without floor coverings in all their rooms. So they're walking around on concrete, um, they're having to wear shoes in their house. Um, we had stories of people that were cutting their feet on their floor because um, they don't have any coverings there. People that are buying up um, cheap foam matting that's meant for children and laying that across their flooring. Um, and within that, these tenants were. Uh, they told us that it was their bedrooms, living room and hallway that were most likely to not have any floor covering. And that's likely due to the interpretation of the decent home standard that it requires flooring in um, kitchens and bathrooms or that when people are fitting kitchens and bathrooms, which are a requirement through the decent home standard, that they um, ha come with flooring as standard. Um, and furniture poverty estimate that around 760,000 adults in social housing may be living without floor coverings. So there's um, 1.2 million people living without floor coverings um, in the UK and 61% of those are living in social housing. So you're much more likely to be living without flooring if you're living in social housing. So why don't landlords provide floor coverings at point of let? I think an important point to say here is that actually uh, because there's a risk taste risk um, based approach to um, providing housing then a lot of landlords actually take up flooring when um, they prepare a property for relet so once somebody hands in the keys they go through a voids process and that voids process will involve making repairs but it also might involve ripping up the carpet and a lot of the reason for that um, are captured in this survey where we ask people to rank the barriers to providing floor coverings at point of let and that's a, a risk of fleas and pest infestations um, and this lack of clarity between the landlord and tenant in terms of the responsibilities for the um, upkeep of it, as well as um, the costs around ongoing maintenance. But the main barrier around it was the financial cost to the organisation. Um, but when we looked at these um, issues within the third learning report, we attempted to address each of them in turn to show that they're not necessarily a barrier and some of them are myths like there's no evidence of fleas and pest infestations and some of them um, can be overcome so for, for example the financial cost to the organisation as with many things if you make the cost up front if you put the floor coverings in then there's financial benefits further on and I'll talk about some of those impacts in a bit um, and when it comes to the lack of parity about responsibilities then people can um, gift floor coverings to the tenant using gifting agreements so there's ways that can this these um, barriers can be overcome and when we look at the funding and finance which is important for this conference of course um, then we estimated that the average cost of flooring for um, a landlord is around a thousand pounds per property and that's based on the average cost of budget carpet underlay and fitting at 19 pounds per square meter and then additional costs for stairs um, and then the English what the English housing survey tells us is the average size of a social rented home. Um, the average cost to a household is £920 and that's because we assume that they don't need to cover the whole home as um, tenants told us that they had these, this partial flooring. Um, 
and these costs our estimates were backed up by the interview data with the landlords and also the um, resident voice index survey data where 45 percent of respondents reported paying over a thousand pounds and 31 percent between 501 pounds and a thousand pounds for their floor coverings so how do households pay well, FRS data tells us that social renters are the least likely to have savings when compared to other tenures. So 28% have no savings and the next highest is the PRS at 18% and across all households it's 14%. So um, most, a lot of tenants are then required to take out a loan. That's 28% of um, respondents to the Resident Voice Index survey said they took out a loan and then that puts them into debt and, um, and of those who took out a loan over half took between one to three years to repay um, and younger people and those with the dependents are much more likely to be taking out a loan and some of them took over five years to repay debt um, and for households we modelled that it could take an average of 20 months to fund floor coverings through their income and savings and eight months for lower income households who aren't on universal credit. When it comes to the available funding for households, um, Scottish Welfare Fund in the 12 months, um, it shows that the community care grants for carpet liner or floor coverings totaled 11 million pounds. So that's the amount of money that are going to um, mainly social renters for um, putting in carpet liner and floor coverings. And um, we asked the Scottish government for um, data on the number of repeat applications from social renters and there's about 2,000 repeat applications so that means that households within the same house are going back and asking for additional money for floor coverings. We think that could be repurposed and better used to actually put floor coverings in a point of let. Um, in the Welsh Government there's emergency assistance payments and in England some local authorities offer local welfare assistance still um, and, and for furniture poverty estimate that's perhaps 29 percent there's also the household support fund although we obviously we don't know what's happening with that um, beyond September still um, and there's budgeting advances or budgeting loans for those on benefits although again that does lead to debt um, and then there's grant makers such as Longley and charities um, so there's a lot of link ups with um, car carpet companies who provide off cuts or carpet tiles from um, office refurbishments um, but you have to question whether you would live in a house that has carpet tiles from um, an office um, in it and whether that would feel like a home to you. In terms of the impact uh, for households, we found that a lack of floor covering is linked to debt and stigma. So um, the one of the main sentiment um, responses to the survey was it left fe people feeling poor. Um, it also leads to less community integration because people don't want to invite people into their home and um, they're embarrassed by the fact they don't have floor coverings. It leads to noise um, travelling more easily between homes. Um, so there's a report by the Housing Ombudsman that spotlights noise complaints and a lot of them are linked to the fact there's not adequate flooring between properties. Yeah, there's a reduced feeling of walk home and perception of warmth and there's also that environmental impact from um, landlords disposing of carpets uh, as part of that void process not to mention disruption from tenants moving into homes that don't have floor coverings um, and then having to put them in after they've moved and it can also um, lead to social return on investment so again this is in furniture poverty data which shows that um, floor coverings as part of an essential package of um, furniture can provide an SROI of just under 7,500 and there's also really important points in terms of preventing a domestic abuse survivors returning to perpetrators because they're in an adequately furnished carpeted home, preventing homelessness. Um, so there was a study in, 20, in 2016 that found that um, tenancy failure was 15% higher for unfurnished tenancies um, compared to furnished. And it can improve community safety because, um, there's, again, there's um, literature showing that um, when households move into homes that aren't adequately carpeted, then children spend more time outside where they might engage in risk taking behaviour. Um, and it's better for child development. They can crawl around on the floor. Um, and it's also important consideration for health, such as links to asthma or um, for dementia sufferers. Um, and, and it's got to be considered what is adequate and um, appropriate flooring for um, people that suffer those from those conditions. 
And for landlords, there are impacts from a reduced void turnover. So um, 13, who um, a housing association up in Teesside, they saw their voids um, when they introduced um, carpets, they saw voids fall from 600 a year to 200 a year. Um, and Citizen, who operate in the Midlands and another housing association, they when they did a pilot, they saw an 8% reduction in um, their void turnover. So the number of properties that are coming back through tenants leaving. Um, and a 30% and 50% uh, reduction over a 12 month period in another. Um, and because of that, there's also a reduced void loss because um, if a property becomes void, then the tenant isn't living in it, then they're not paying rent. So um, uh, provide, reducing that void turnover means that you're not get, losing as much money for um, rent. Um, and also because you're not getting that turnover, then there's reduced void costs because you're not having to um, continually go into properties and make the repairs that I mentioned. Um, there's also increased staff and tenant satisfaction, uh, reduced refusal rates. So when people see the um, properties, they're more likely to accept them um, rather than refuse them. And as well as improvements in tenant health and wellbeing, um, reduced likelihood and severity of falls, um, which is one of the reasons decent home standard and, and the health and housing safety rating system was put in, in the first place. Um, fewer complaints concerning noise. Um, in terms of what we are calling for and recommending through the research, it's that there is government funding to improve and, and an improvement in standards within that. Um, and we've modelled how much that would be. It's quite big figures, as you might imagine. Um, but there are ways that you can reduce that depending on um, the length of time that you um, put in that, that put in for carpeting all homes, all those 4.9 million homes. Um, but we estimate it would be around just under 500 million in the first year and it would reduce in subsequent years um, from um, lower turnover of lets due to the improved standards um, and as it moves to one of replacement only rather than having to introduce it into a number of homes. We're also asking housing associations, asking social landlords to stop removing good quality floor coverings um, unless the incoming tenant asks them to. Um, and we've also put some pilot tools into our final report to ask them to test um, a floor covering pilot in their properties um, and using control groups and test different outcomes and um, collect different data points um, to help them measure that and see what impact it has for them. Um, we're also asking tenants and social landlords to talk to each other about the impact of floor coverings. So if a social landlord is putting in floor coverings at the point of let, then talking about the benefits of that and for tenants talking to their landlord um, about the impact of not having floor coverings at point of let. And just a final word to say thank you to our steering group um, and also just happy to take any questions um, and I hope you found that interesting. And I know, I know having moved into social housing, I, um, I was quite shocked to realise, um, and I, I mean moved in in terms of moving into it as an area of work, but I was quite shocked to realise that um, floor coverings weren't provided as standard, particularly when you consider that people living in social housing are amongst lowest income groups and, and least likely to have the money to afford carpets. And so we feel this is a really important area of research and we'd really like to see a change in standards and practice um, across the country. Thanks.